So, ladies and gentlemen, it's great to, to be here. Today I'm looking, um, I'm, I, I'm almost um, showing some of the wares. You'll have a flyer in front of you, uh, which is perhaps rather inelegantly uh, placed, uh, as it's a flyer with a discount code from yeah. Rowledge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this book comes out, I think, um, I think it says, it's coming out in June, end of June. Um, but um, it's a completely revised, entirely revised, second edition of a book uh, called The Struggle for Labour's Soul that we, we did 14 years ago in 2004 when New Labour was in its pomp, when it carried all before it, when it was dominating British politics, when it was setting Western European political agenda as a social democratic, socially progressive, pro-European, majority commanding government. And if we think where we are now, friends, we're a long way from Kansas, I think. Now we're not in Kansas anymore. Uh, and so I, I think really it, 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 it's incredibly valuable to reflect on what is just contemporary history, but just to see how much um, British politics has changed and just how, how far the progressive wing, and I'll get on to what I mean by that, and the different vernacular and nomenclature uh, have, have stuttered and stumbled in these mere 14 years. So the, the central question one has to ask, particularly when you're in the United States and you're talking about the word progressive, is who are the progressives? Well, for me, I, I tend to take the, the moderate wing of the Labour Party, the right wing of the Labour Party, at their word when they self-identify as progressives. So um, Tony Blair's administration, Gordon Brown's administration, which is the, uh, represents the 13 years of New Labour, but then um, after Gordon Brown's era, the five years that the Labour Party was led by Ed Miliband, whilst he was um, sidestepping to the left a wee bit on macroeconomic policy and, and certainly taking a, a different view about humanitarian intervention and some foreign policy. Um, very much within the family of moderate social democracy and they themselves today call themselves progressives. The main think tank is called Progress, that's the name of their magazine. Um, I think the other thing that's fascinating is and it really starts with Blair, but you can look through the speeches of Brown as well. The fact that they don't self-identify any longer as social democrats is significant in and of itself. There's something that is almost um, notable by its omission. They don't self-identify as social democrats. Uh, I think in their mindset, and I've interviewed a number of them and I've written on this, and on New Labour a lot, is perhaps because their view of political economy and globalisation felt that social democracy is a bit too etatiste or dirigiste and centralising and top-down, it's too interventionist, it perhaps has too strong a connotation perhaps of um, the politics of the 1970s in Britain with pretty robust trade union activism. And so it's important, I think, the fact that they don't identify as social democrats. So really the progressives are the right wing, of the parliamentary Labour Party, uh, they are the um, they are the today they're the successors to the Blairites and the Brownites, and there was never a great real deal of difference between the two. There was a difference about the single currency. There was a wee bit of difference about to what extent markets uh, and uh, market reform can increase efficiency of public sector reform and the provision of public goods. But really, there wasn't a, a huge great ideological difference between Blair and Brown and their, and their followers. It was more about personality and temperament. And, um, and you, you can't really disaggregate Gordon Brown from the New Labour project, the most powerful chancellor that Britain has ever had, completely in control of social policy as well as economic policy for 10 years, and then, uh, and then prime minister. So very much a project, the New Labour project, a progressive project, a moderate project, a project that was seeking to win over the centre ground and reach out to, you know, not just um, traditional Labour voters and the sort of like liberal left intelligentsia, but also to the suburban voters, floating voters. In the 100 constituencies throughout the United Kingdom, the vast majority in England, and that's crucial, that determine the, uh, determine the governments of the United Kingdom. 
there's a, you know, there's a, you know, about one sixth of the seats determine the outcome. And, and so this project sought to not just um, shift the Labour Party to the right, it, it sought to displace the Conservatives as the natural party of government. So the people we're talking about, the progressives are today, are the successors to New Labour in the tradition of Blair and Brown and to an extent, of course, of Ed Miliband. So, I mean, one of the things I think is important is to try and get a sense of what do they stand for. Well, I would say that they, they're very much comfortable with a, with a fair degree of, of, of free market economics, certainly of a market economy. But they don't believe in the unbridled free market. They're not Hayekians in that sense. They believe in trade unionism. Uh, and they certainly believe in a welfare state. I think it's most helpful to categorise them as welfare capitalists in that sense. Um, they're not seeking to have a radical shift in the ordering of a market economy to a greater degree of public ownership. Certainly not in, interested in workers' democracy or industrial democracy. Uh, they're focused on industrial relations as individual trade union rights. Um, they're incredibly pro-European pro-European Union. I mean, one of the things that really marks their, uh, marks their um, ideational uh, worldview out is that they are absolutely committed to Britain being a member of the European Union. Now, that's not worked out too well for them, but they are trying. They are fighting their good fight, the valiant fight, as they see it, to um, uh, filibuster, to use the courts, to use every opportunity as they are allowed in a free and plural society on television to persuade, cajole, to try and raise money, to frustrate, to antagonize the, the general movement which is one predicated upon um, delivering to the British people that which a majority, albeit an incredibly small majority, set forth on the 23rd of June 2016 in the largest poll in the history of British democratic politics. 33 million people voted. It's approximately, imagine if like all of California turned out and voted, it's pretty much that. So that's a huge data point. So they are raging and raging against that because they feel very much as progressives as people who are more sort of e more economically liberal and very much who have bought into the notion of a kind of the world is incredibly independent and highly globalised, they feel that Britain is not just best placed to secure its economic interests, but actually Britain has to be interdependent within a regional bloc, which is obviously um, the European Union. I think the other thing I wanted to say about them is that they are kindred as a, as a segment of the, the main centre-left party in the United Kingdom. They're kindred with the Keating faction of the Australian Labour Party, with the New Democrats in the, in the US Democratic Party, and with some, I say some, of the Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats, the Progressive Grouping in the EU. Not all, that's important. Even some of that grouping are too left-wing and too interventionist, I think, for some of the, uh, the sort of um, uber Blairites, I would suggest. So what do they believe? What do these progressives on the centre-left today believe? Well, I think they believe, um, they, I think they hold that human nature is pretty positive on balance. They have, a, they have a more optimistic view, not in a blithe, utopian way, but they have, they have a more optimistic view about human nature. They have a more optimistic view about rationality, about what government can achieve, about the problems that actually can be solved. Um, they have a more positive view, optimistic view, about social progress. Some would suggest, would paint a picture of history, almost like, for those of you that are aware of this, of the, the Whig interpretation of history. That we are, in the West, getting better and better and better. We are progressing further and further and further with education rates, with technology. We can see the sunlit uplands. We can see the light on the hill, the new Jerusalem, and we are going towards that. I must admit, as a historian of the 20th century, I do not buy that argument for one minute. I think human nature can be kind and compassionate, we can learn, we can be enlightened, and we can be devils. And I think the body count of the 20th century and the ideologies that have been born in European civilization, I think are the outstanding data point to give us great caution. 
Um, but nonetheless, they're more, more positive, more optimistic about what can be done, what can be done in government, that public, how public policy uh, problems can be uh, framed, understood, and perhaps acted upon. They lose them, I said about the Whig interpretation. I think the other thing is, they're not always, but they're quite often secularists. They have a more secular view, a sort of humanist secularist view of, um, of, um, of, of, of ethics and belief. What some people might be surprised at in this talk is that I would also suggest that there is within their um, progressivism and their liberalism, their economic liberalism, their social liberalism, uh, which is a very noble tradition in my opinion, there is also another tradition I think that has come in into the progressives from the 1990s. It's been in the labour movement for a good long while, going back to the 1960s, but into the progressives into the 1990s. And that is what I guess is best called cultural Marxism, not economic Marxism, not classical Marxism in a kind of class-based revolutionary sense, but a form of cultural Marxism, a way of viewing oppression, a way of viewing um, changing almost the notion of social justice that, say, Clement Attlee had. Clement Attlee's notion of social justice was that the market economy leads to certain externalities and that markets don't clear to equilibrium. And so you need the active hand of government to try and ameliorate those um, externalities. Um, and that's really what the welfare state was for. It was implemented by the Attlee government. It was the, it was the, it was the idea, as you know, of William Beveridge, the, the liberal peer. But the Attlee government made it more social democratic. They made it more comprehensive. And crucially, they, 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 they really upheld the, prin the principle of contribution that it was the, that the nation was a very strong impetus in Attlee and Ernest Bevin's mind. And through forging that common sacrifice in the war, there needed to be a peace dividend. And the way to have this peace dividend and to, um, to um, insulate against market um, ex negative externalities was to have a form of a welfare state where one and one and one's family could pay in and then draw down in times of sickness and a when one is aged and when... Uh, things before one in the market economy. And so that was what social justice meant. I think on the, for the progressives, social justice means something very different from that today. I think it means something that really is about, that comes from cultural Marxism and postmodernism today. I think it means a situation of people. I don't think it means how people are necessarily just impacted by the market economy. I think it, it's something far more textured, sociological, and, and rooted, I think, in a very overtly normative worldview. Well, everything's rooted in a normative worldview, but I would say this, this is rooted less in a tradition of liberalism or social democracy, and more in a tradition of cultural Marxism. And I think we, you can, if you want, you could go back and you can look at uh, Foucault and uh, Lyotard and um, uh, Lacan and uh, the French uh, postmodernists of the 1960s and 70s. Um, it can be seen in the progressive's attitude to this notion of intersectionality, which is a relatively new one in British politics, concepts of patriarchy, hate speech, and the social construction of gender. Uh, again, these are pretty new, uh, pretty recent in Labour's long 100 and, uh, 120 odd year history, pretty new things to be front and centre on the moderate wing of the Labour Party. And that's important because I think that leads to a disconnect, which I'll come on to in a moment. It's very important to say that the progressives have not always been ineffective. They have been tremendously effective. They have been, as I, I wrote an essay called New Labour and the Politics of Dominance, in a book I did with my writing partner Simon Lee, in a book called Ten Years of New Labour. And I still think that at, in their pomp, and there were shortcomings, and some of their great successes actually fundamentally weakened the case of progressive centre-left politics in the long run, but nonetheless, they were not always ineffective. Um, I think one has to just accept the fact that they won two landslide elections, two consecutive landslides, when Labour had never served, Labour government had never served two consecutive full terms until Tony Blair. I think that is just remarkable. Um, and then the third election, they had a significantly large majority, not a landslide, but a majority of 66. So they, they were carrying all before them. And if we cast our mind back to scholars of European studies, we can think of across Western Europe at that time, there, it was almost like there was a social democratic tide, or certainly a progressive tide. And um, the progressives were able to bring people with them who would not normally be in their political constituency. Um, one thinks of, um, of Jospan in particular, but also Schroeder, I think, as well, 
Um, but there are others as well, of course. Um, so they, were, they had, particularly around Blair and Brown's early years of Tony Blair's administration, the ability, I think, to construct a narrative that was based on a social coalition of working class and middle class, of suburban, uh, traditional uh, working class uh, areas rooted in heavy industry in the post-industrial economy, as well as, as well as your left liberal kind of uh, university towns. Now that is no mean feat. The Labour Party has very seldom achieved such a coalition. How do I know? In the 20th century, the Labour Party was in government about one third of the time. And that's my evidence for that. Um, but also people who were more socially conservative as well as socially liberal. Uh, they were able to hold that together. And a lot of Blair's n narrative, particularly on the law and order agenda, was more socially conservative, more sort of communitarian. So it appe appealed to a sort of, say, the Daily Express and Daily Mail and Daily Mirror readers. Um, it appealed to a, a kind of a conservative working class, a conservative Labourite view. Um, uh, and so I think in the early days there was that, there was that appeal. It, and, and because of that, it forced the Conservative Party, moved it left, particularly on international development, so funding for heavily indebted poor countries, uh, especially, I would say, also on the environment, on attitudes toward the Kyoto Protocol, to take really seriously issues of climate change, but also on social ethics, being more socially liberal on certain things. And I think the, uh, the arrival, the emergence of David Cameron, as a Conservative leader in 2005, and it was a very, a very uh, stiff fight between him and David Davis at the time, and Cameron prevailed, and, and then was obviously um, Conservative leader for the next 11 years, and Prime Minister for six. I think it's evidence of this um, liberal conservatism, this very, very light blue progressivism. He famously said, and I would have thought this, this cost him greatly with actual Tory activists, he said, famously said, and as the leader of the opposition, when Gordon Brown was Prime Minister at the dispatch box, he said, I am the heir to Blair. No, you, not you, I am the heir. So I think this, this is not just painting a picture, I think it's building a, an evidential case that New Labour was incredibly, the progressives were incredibly, incredibly effective. They didn't just win elections, they didn't just form a social coalition, which today is un... One could not even conceive of that sort of coalition. But British politics is so polarised. But also he forced the main rivals, the dominant Conservative Party, to change ground on key areas. But I think, and I argue that they are now really increasingly ineffective. I think they're ineffective for a number of reasons. I'm just going to give you three. There's always three points, isn't there? There's always three points. There's a kind of unity about three. A tri-unity, a trinity. Um, three points. The first I've called the values gap when I've been writing recently in articles but also in essays. I've often just found myself coming back to this notion of the values gap. A gap between the Labour Party elites, the MPs, and Labour Party activists, card-carrying members. A gap between those, those folk who are the boots on the ground and who are the representatives in councils and in in legislatures, because of course we have an asymmetric policy in the United Kingdom, we have a Scottish Parliament, we have a power-sharing executive, please God, that it gets back up and running in Northern Ireland, we have uh, an assembly in Wales, and we also have uh, a, a London, um, a London mayoralty, and we have obviously local governments, local councils throughout the United Kingdom and um, uh, United Kingdom government, so we have Labour representation uh, pretty much throughout, not in Northern Ireland, they have a sister party, uh, there, um, but they, but we have Labour activists and Labour representatives right across the United Kingdom, and the gap is between those, that unit, and people who are not Labour activists, but have been and would would have one time regarded themselves as Labour inclined voters. So not not dues paying members, but who would would have been by tradition, by custom by inclination, by disposition, by family bonds, Labour people. That's the gap. That is the gap. And there's polling to back this up, we'll get to that in a minute. So, and I would say it's because the progressives worldview has evolved, has, as our society has evolved in the last 20 odd years, 25 years, the worldview of the progressives, the progressive left, not the hard left of the Labour Party, but the sort of the new Labourite kind of left, 
is not merely different to that of English, especially English, and I say English because the vast majority of citizens in the United Kingdom are, are English. So that's the, that's, it's the preponderance of the English. Um, diff, it's in, it exists in contradistinction to labour-inclined, working-class English voters, especially in the North and the Midlands. So the world views are not just intention, they exist in contradistinction. You know, there's a huge gap. You could call it the values chasm, the values gap, I think it's got more of a ring to it. And I think this can be understood with, a re you know, to, b b b with reference to a range of different things. What you might want to call third wave feminism, um, you know, pro-Europeanism, and by that I mean pro-European unionism, um, mass migration from the EU member states, especially from 2004 onwards, but also 2007, with the accession um, countries of the former Soviet Union. Issues of social ethics, so that comes back to these notions of cultural Marxism, intersectionality, and what have you. The Human Rights Act 1998 has been highly controversial, for um, not in Parliament, not amongst the progressive, you know, progressive um, dining room, dinner party chats, but you know, in traditional um, working class areas, and you can see um, people feel that also taps into people's, I think, uh, annoyance at elites. Um, and, um, and then and the activism of, of a non-European Union institution, the European C Court of Human Rights. Um, you see this in the headlines about the difficulty Britain has about deporting um, uh, terrorists and, and what have you. So I think it seems um, that there is a disconnect over culture and values. To an extent economics, but far less economics. Culture and values. There are a number of data points. I think a few things are very interesting. Um, well, well, you know, one thing I just draw your attention to that in the 2010 general election, which was a rather dull general election, one of the most memorable moments, I'd say, for the Labour Party on the campaign trail was Gordon Brown. He was in Rochdale, a uh, um, town in Lancashire. And Gordon Brown um, happened upon a lifelong Labour voter, a pensioner, grandmother called Mrs. Gillian Duffy. And Mrs. Duffy was um, wanting to um, buttonhole, and not in an impolite way, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, just to say that she felt that uh, the preponderance of um, Eastern European migrants uh, had been a bad thing for, for youths on her housing estate, for young, uh, uh, young folk, especially young men in Rochdale. So this mass migration, mass white migration from Eastern Europe had been an issue for... Um, the, these folks. It wasn't an issue of, of, of skin colour, it was an issue of uh, numbers and impact. And, and Brown gave a kind of standard answer to it and it was kind of that was it. He got back in his car and it whizzed off, but his lapel mic was still on. And uh, one of his aides asked him about, the, about his interlocutor, about the exchange, and he said, oh, it was just some bigoted woman. And the campaign blew up. Um, his media advisors thought, this is not going to be good. We're already struggling in many of these, uh, with many of these voters. I mean, truth be told, quite frankly, because the first past the post election system, electoral system in the United Kingdom is what it is, a majoritarian um, sort of um, pluralist system. You know, Labour hangs on to most of these seats anyway. But, you know, Huge amounts of people were starting to consider the UKIP, the United Kingdom Independence Party. Some of them were thinking about voting Tory, although less so with David Cameron being perceived as quite metropolitan and quite liberal. And so the Prime Minister stopped, did an about turn, went to Mrs Duffy's house and gave a personal apology for his dreadful behaviour and the insult uh, that he laid upon her. Because she said, There's a, you know, she, she, had the, she had the temerity to say to the most powerful person in the United Kingdom, that mass low skill and no skill migration uh, that had been completely unmanaged, where it had been managed through transition controls by Germany and France, was something that, ne that necessarily made you a racist. And I think that is crucial. And some might say, oh, that was just a bit of media. I think that's crucial. If the leader of the Labour Party, the leader of the Labour movement, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, you know, the Queen's First Minister, the primus inter pares, the first among equals of the government, if he thinks that, 
this man who has a PhD in labor history, this alleged son of the manse, if he thinks that about such a person, about such a uh, legitimate comment, then I think that tells you a huge amount about the values gap. Also, I think the other data point, whizzing on five years later, is that 37% of electors who voted uh, for the Labour Party, and that was led then by Ed Miliband in 2015, 37% voted leave in the 2016 referendum on whether the United Kingdom should stay part of the European Union. That's not a small percentage. Again, it just denotes the values gap. Values gap, but also negative legacy. There were huge successes. People could point to, I think, under the progressives. I think a number of people would point to the way that public services had a, a real reinvestment, health, education, transport, policing. I would think an awful lot of people would also point to the investment in sure start centres, in early years education, um, in trying to help uh, families where mum and dad are working and have children get back to work, provide them with childcare that makes it flexible so they can earn a second income in an economy that pretty much requires it. Um, I think also, and some of you would be more critical about that, I would be more favourable about what I'm about to say, I think the progressives approach to New Deal for Communities funding so looking at the, 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 the hundred or so neighbourhoods throughout the United Kingdom which are in the highest, have the highest incidence um, of deprivation and trying to give targeted fundings and to try and bring local stakeholders on board to decide how their housing estate, how their districts can be improved. Yes, a lot of money was spent. Sometimes you go back to these places today and they're still quite depressing, but often there were success stories. I've been to a number of them myself. Um, I know a wee bit about that because my wife, my wife wrote her MSc dissertation as a town planner on New Deal for Community Funding. So I think that was a really, a really good piece of active government, and it also was it was quite particip participatory. That's you know I thought it was re relatively relatively successful. Um, and we talked about you know the environmental agenda as well, but there were great I think uh, damaging legacies. Of course, the Iraq War. I'm not going to go into that, but I think that 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 was wonderfully one. I think the curtailment of civil liberties in the wake of not just 9-11, but 7-7, when we experienced um, the great threat, and which is to this day the great domestic threat. I mean, you have Russia, which is also the great foreign threat at the moment to uh, Europe and to the United Kingdom, um, but the great domestic threat is British-born Islamic fundamentalist terrorists, so British-born jihadis, whose doctrine of Wahhabism I think um, is is you know is is still the, the the greatest concern I think for homeland security, and so you had the prevent strategy rolled out, and each government has sort of added to that, but still is kind of holding to that. So the curtailment of civil liberties, the kind of crackdown in the wake of the seven seven uh, atrocities, and proposals about detention without trial. Um, it really looked like this was a government having a knee jerk reaction and was trampling over the liberties, ancient liberties of the United Kingdom, ancient liberties root, rooted in English common law, actually. Um, and so there was Labour, back, there were backbench rebellions and all sorts of uh, difficulties. Eventually the government, um, the Blair government relented and took a more uh, moderate approach, a more moderate approach. But I think that dented an awful lot of people's view within the Labour movement of, of this progressive project. Uh, the uh, stark increase in income inequality and the culture of media management, the fact that it was so controlled, so polished, so spun. I think the third thing um, which shows why they, they are, they've emerged, uh, they've declined in their effectiveness has been the phenomena which is the emergence of Jeremy Corbyn. Um, Jeremy Corbyn is a veteran, uh, labour left, hard left, some people would call it, uh, the grouping would be called the Socialist Campaign Group. Uh, some would call it Labour Marxism. Um, veteran or backbench um, MP, a, a man of very deep principle. He's um, very authentic. He, he, um, we all know what he believes. He's given uh, asked thousands of questions over a 30-something year career. They're all on Hansard. You can go and look at them. Um, he's given hundreds of speeches to protest groups. Stop the War Coalition and um, uh, all sorts of all sorts of um, 
protest groups. He speaks historically, he's spoken an awful lot about the environment, about immigration and migrant rights, uh, and about um, Palestinian rights, and about um, the, the problem of the British arms trade, and about how Britain should um, engage in unilateral nuclear disarmament. They have been his themes. They have been his, his um, um, uh, areas of expertise. They have been the issues that he's cared most about, I think, would be a reasonable thing to say. And, and this man um, was elected leader in 2015, um, and he only just got his nomination in a few minutes before the end of uh, uh, the deadline in 2015, and actually some progressives, some moderates, voted for him because they wanted to broaden the debate, and they wanted... So, you know, they didn't just want three progressives on the panel, so they, 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 um, they opened the door uh, in terms of the rules. He just about had enough people, because the Labour left was so small anyway, he wouldn't have had enough nominations if just his own faction voted for him. So actually some progressives voted for him. And, mm -hmm. and then he undertook a fantastic, energetic, fresh, different campaign. And um, secured 6% of the vote, with over a quarter of a million votes cast for his candidacy out of a total of 422,000. And with that, he garnered 50% of party members as an electoral college, 50% of party members, 58% of affiliated um, organisations, okay, and 84% of this new group of registered supporters. It was a new grouping. Um, as Miliband left, he kind of he ushered in this new grouping where you could, you could join for three pounds for the price of a, a latte and you could vote. Uh, that was a mechanism very much that appealed to young people who didn't have to spend £25 or £20 and uh, make a commitment to go along to incredibly exciting Labour Party branch meetings on a monthly basis and talk about composite motions. But it, 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 it was a very low barrier to entry. One could, one could pay £3, three quid, and then vote. I actually had some students who were UKIP students and Conservative students who paid £3 and voted for Jeremy Corbyn. Um, not good. I'm sure, I'm sure there was a fair bit of that. Um, but he would have won anyway. His campaign was incredibly uh, focused, it was energetic, um, and it was unspun. And it wasn't media managed in that same sense in the early days. It's very media managed now. But in the early days, it wasn't. And I think he really fired up an awful lot of young people. And he had a very clear uh, message of jobs, of housing, and free higher education. So it was an anti austerity message. It was a message of actually a more activist government, an activist economy, <coughs> uh, economic, uh, activist political economy, beg pardon. And yeah, I think that was, for many people within the Labour movement, a tonic, a tonic to what had been before with the moderation and the, and the, uh, and, and the kind of um, uh, the technocracy of, of, of the Blair and the Brown, and to a lesser extent the Miliband years. And as of summer 2017, the Labour Party has, according to a House of Commons Library briefing note at 550,000 members. It's the largest party in Western Europe. That's the Corbyn effect. Completely. Largest party or largest socialist party? Largest party. Are you just counting in those also the, the three pounders? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the House of Commons Library is not me. Okay. But yeah, I'm, I think that's as reliable as you can get when you have um, statistics that are changing. I mean, it's like, what's that we're talking about? Nine months from when it was done. But yeah, and part of the, part of the accounting process, I believe, is that they, the Labour Party is asked. So these researchers from the House of Commons Library haven't actually probably been given access to Labour Party databases. But, you know, it's, it's, the, work, it's the figure we're working with. And I think it's probably right, actually. I've heard higher figures, much higher figures. But I think there is an issue about to what extent a huge amount of these young people are actually have uh, have, um, have gone to branch meetings. But I think what an awful lot of young people have done, and not just young people, a lot of people who've left the Labour Party during the progressive years, over Iraq, over the curtailment of civil liberties, over uh, widespread in income inequality, they've rejoined, actually. And I think they've actually turned up to lots of protest rallies. And his, his oratory is less about, uh, it's less about um, Gordon Brown. You know, Brown would be a very policy-strong Kind of orator, and it would be it would be here's the problem, here's the solution, and 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 I think what what Corbyn had used is a very much a protest speech patter, uh, which is in a very the long tradition of the Labour left to to address the the big group and to sort of like to, to play to the sense of hope and things can change and idealism, and I think he's been incredibly successful at that. So I've, I've listed 
the, in, the, in the last few slides, slides the issue of um, um, the ineffectiveness and, and the explanations to why. So what's the state of play? Well, Labour's National Executive <coughs> Committee is dominated by the Corbynites, sometimes they're called the Corbynistas, the hard left. They're dominated by that now. And that's really important. That's its main uh, coordinating committee. Uh, even in the early 1980s, even when Michael Foote was leader and Tony Benn was challenging Dennis Healy to be the deputy leader, the NEC was not dominated by the Bennites. And Corbyn's um, uh, role model, Corbyn's um, mentor, uh, his tutor, was Tony Benn. So when you think of, if those of you who have got more of a, a connection in the history and understanding of the Labour Party back in the day, when you think Corbyn, you must think he's in that Benite tradition, um, that kind of um, yeah, that kind of Benite tradition. And so the, the National Executive Committee was not dominated then uh, in the way it is now. The main Labour Party supporting trade unions, uh, the leaders are pretty left wing, they're very supportive of Corbyn. Um, progressives, the Labour progressives, the Blairite, Brownite sort of uh, contemporaries, have been squeezed out of many constituency Labour parties by pro-Corbyn activists. Uh, his, these activists um, have coalesced around a group called Momentum, which helped get him um, elected, which helped organise rallies, which helped bring young people together. He did 99 rallies throughout the United Kingdom. And let's not forget, he didn't just win a, a leadership election in 2015. He was also challenged by a progressive, a Welsh man called um, Owen Smith and, and Corbyn beat him and took him on the year later. So Jeremy Corbyn is incredibly legitimate, incredibly secure, incredibly rooted in a, in a growing and mass membership Labour Party bringing back some, um, some um, left-wingers who have been completely uh, turned off politics by the moderation of the progressives and the Blair and Brown years and also firing up lots of young people. But I would probably also say that there's other, some other folk who've come back still. There's some people who've come back further still. There are some, a very, there's a small group, I wouldn't say a huge amount, but probably several thousand of hard radicals who've come back from groups like Tusk and um, social, you know, socialist workers' parties and things like this. One or two incredibly high profile people who've actually gone straight into uh, momentum. Um, but they're pretty small. But then you don't have to have a large amount of people. New Labour was incredibly small when it started. If You just need people who are talented and and dedicated. You need diehards, right? You need diehards. So, um, it's, he's really consolidated his, his influence. The Labour Party is, to all intents and purposes, a Corbynite party, apart from the fact, ladies and gentlemen, friends, apart from the fact that still a majority of MPs, Labour MPs, a majority of the parliamentary Labour Party in, in Westminster are progressives. And that is curious. Because one of the things that has been mooted, and it's, it's going around time and time again, is this issue of mandatory reselection in the run-up to the general election. So it's, almost like, it's almost like a test of faith when someone would ask, what is the shibboleth? You know, what is the, um, what is the um, show us and prove to us that you are a true believer? And I, that is obviously giving many progressives uh, to use a very old-fashioned word, the collie wobbles. But we shall see. I thought maybe two years ago this was very unlikely. Now that the NEC is controlled pretty much and consolidation with key funding labour unions, I could potentially see it. So I think the Corbynites have now established and uh, consolidated their control. And I think the progressive MPs and the progressive activists um, struggle institutionally, struggle structurally, and struggle at a le level of message to actually set out what they are for, when what they are for is actually really unappealing for an awful lot of Labour-inclined voters. And an awful lot of Labour activists think that it's time for a more left-wing, a more radical socialism. Thank you very much indeed.